Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hi everyone, uh, Eid Mubarak uh, for everyone here in Singapore and also for around the world. Now it's uh, Eid for Muslims, Eid al Adhar. So wishing everyone Eid Mubarak. And uh, today is the second episode of season four of uh, the Shahero Nightlife. And the title is Miracles of the Final Testament, the Glorious Quran. So by the way, um, you know, we have a lot of miracles in the Quran. And of course, we can't share them all in one hour. I will do our best. So without much further ado, I will bring, bring the guest for tonight. All right. So tonight, hang on. Let me put this yeah, full screen. <laughs> okay. We have uh, Sister Nyla Edwards all the way from London. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, sister. Waalaikum assalam and Eid Mubarak to all of you and Eid Mubarak to everybody watching today. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And uh, beside her is a brother Iskandar from Rotterdam in Holland. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, brother. Waalaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and Eid Zaid, everybody. And uh, it's nice to be, it's good to be back. It's been a long time. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Uh, and next, uh, we have uh, just below him, uh, Brother Idris Ali from the United States in Seattle. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, brother. Waalaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Eid Mubarak. Eid Mubarak. Yep. Alhamdulillah. And next, we have finally Brother Hafiz Jabbar from Singapore. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Eid Mubarak. Waalaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Eid Mubarak to you and the team as well. And Thank all you. Those Thank you. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Thank you everyone for tuning in and also to the panelists for uh, joining us in tonight's session. And tonight, I know the session is quite a big topic and it's not possible to cover all in one hour and we do our best to research on our own and to share what we have. So uh, forgive us if we didn't cover everything, but there's of course, we're going to do part two and part three and part four hopefully in the future. Uh, we'll just do our best for tonight. Uh, before we also begin, I just want to share with you um, about this charity. Maybe, Sister Naila, before we begin, we should talk a bit about uh, the charity that you are running so that we can get an understanding of tonight's topic and why we want to share it. Um, I'll share the screen of the charity drive that she's running. Hang on, share screen. And here we... Oh, no, where is it? Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you start that. I'll uh, I'll talk about it. So uh, recently, oh, yeah. alhamdulillah, I was blessed with the chance to go on a charity deployment to the Gambia with Help Your Team. And, uh, you know, while I was there, the, the people there just blew my mind. Subhanallah. Um, they have very, very many people there have little to nothing. You know, we visited about nine different villages while we were there over five days. And the, 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 the thing that I noticed in every village I went to was they don't have much access to clean water, if any. They don't have much food, especially meat. Meat is like a real luxury. But when we sat down with the elders of each village and asked them, like, what are your needs? How can we help you? Every single place we went, they wanted two things. They wanted a masjid so that they could pray together as a community. And they wanted a madrasa, a school, so that they could have their kids studying. And, you know, maybe the fees for a teacher for the whole year. Because many places we went, they study in rooms that look like prison cells. They don't even have desks. They've just got like a log that they sit on and a wall painted black that they use as a chalkboard. And no AC, no lights, no fans, nothing. And it's so hot, you know. Um, and they didn't care about the conditions, but they're like, our kids can only study for half the year. We can only afford to pay their teacher for half the year. So these were the necessities that they felt were first in line in, in what they needed. Um, and the, the charity I went with Help Ya Team, you know, the, they have such a beautiful initiative, you know, for education, for helping the orphans. And so we went to a school that they've established like three months ago. Uh, a Quran school. They learn like basic English and Islamic studies and a couple of other subjects as well. But, you know, we, we visited so many madrasas along the way, kind of makeshift, like where they're just sitting and reading Quran all day, literally memorizing the Quran. But the facilities that they built were so beautiful in comparison to what the other children were having to study in. 
um, you know, they put the quality and the care of the of the people who study there in the community, as well as the orphans who study there. And so while we were there, we found out there are 36 um, orphans who are currently studying at their own um, madrasa, uh, Ikra Academy, um, which needs sponsoring for their half of um, course, which is a three year course. And uh, it's only 19 pounds a month, which is like an amazing amount, I thought. So I sponsored one for myself, alhamdulillah. I hope to, you know, create a half of that's going to go into their communities and, and teach the next generations the Quran and keep the Quran moving and living and breathing there. Um, and anyone else can do that as well. Alhamdulillah, you see, we've raised 3,000 pounds this month. Um, I think two or three people have sponsored the entire three years for, for uh, an orphan. Um, other people have sponsored like six months and some people have gone and set up a direct debit to do it every month. But you know, it's such a beautiful initiative because the rewards behind, you know, giving the gift of the Quran to someone is that every letter they read is sadaqa jariya for you. Every ayat they learn is sadaqa jariya for you. Every prayer they pray, that's five prayers a day. And these kids are like five, six, seven, eight, you know, Allahu alam, maybe they'll live another 80 years. That's every prayer for the next 80 years on your scale. And then the children that they teach and their children's children that they teach. The, 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 the gift that this is, like if building a well, amazing, amazing Sadaqa Jari as well, but that well may stop working at some point. This inshallah will never end. As long as their families continue to be Muslim, this never ends as a Sadaqa Jariya for you. And it helps the community stay close to the Quran and keep Islam close. So. A beautiful project so if anybody can sponsor an orphan to become a hafid or just donate a bit of money towards one that would be amazing mashallah thanks for sharing that sister and uh, so everyone you know it's always good to be generous do check out the link i will put it up uh in the description of the video as well as a banner here later um i mean i don't know how you're going to copy this but <laughs> It will also be on my bio on Instagram and on Facebook. So, you know, you can just go to the link, just click on it. And if you would like to donate, just support the charity then. I'll All uh, right. drop a comment if you can pin it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll pin it. How do I pin this? Let me see. Um, Comment. Here we go. Nope. Wait, hang on. <laughs> hang on. I'm getting a hang of technology I've, I've here. I've got a short link for you. Hold on. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Should be it. Yes. So this is the link. Uh, it's on the comments. Okay. So tonight's topic on the Quran. Uh, we'll let Sister Nyla kick off. She has this like 15, 15 points, right? To, to identify that it's the word of God and that is indeed a miracle for mankind. Sister Nyla, you can take away. It just looks like I talk too much. Like I'm on, I'm the only female on the panel and I'm just the one talking the whole time. <laughs> this is by accident. Right. Okay, everybody, don't don't blame it on the sister. <laughs> Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. All right. Uh, so I'm gonna give full credit to where I've actually picked this up from. So I watch a Dawa channel on YouTube called Dawa is Easy. Uh, because it is, it's just being kind and smiling and being a good person um, <laughs> while looking like a Muslim. So um, when he approaches people, mashallah, barakallah, he has a pamphlet that has 15 points that he feels and that I feel proves that the Quran is a miracle and that it is only uh, possible that is the word of God and that it was revealed by God. So I'm going to go through these, uh, and inshallah, uh, once Firdaus takes over, he's going to um, kind of expand on them more and sort of delve more into the actual miracles within. But this is sort of an overview of uh, how the Quran is a, is a miracle. So bismillah. So the Quran itself is a 1,400-year-old uh, book plus at this point. Um, and it remains unchanged in the Arabic language. Of course, when we translate things, uh, there's many different interpretations of different words and Arabic itself is a very complex language. Um, so you can interpret one word to mean many things. But in the Arabic language, it's completely unchanged. And this is agreed upon by uh, non-Muslims and Muslims, atheists, Christians, any uh, theologists who have looked into it have agreed with this point. 
It contains scientific facts that have been proven true, and the facts within it don't contradict established science as we know it today. Historical statements in the Quran are also 100% correct, and prophecies of future events are accurate as well, as well as facts about other religions, such as Christianity and Judaism. Oh, we can't hear you. Hang on, hang on. Okay, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, where was the last point? Sorry, just a sentence behind. Okay. Just one sentence. Um, okay, you can hear me now? Yep, perfect. Okay, so I'll go back to historical statements are 100% correct, and prophecies of future events are accurate as well. Facts about other rel religions, such as Christianity and Judaism, are accurate within the Quran. It's easy to memorize, even though it's in a language that most Muslims don't speak. Millions across the world have memorized it in its entirety, and it's very easy for them to memorize. My daughter, for example, her first language is in Arabic, and she's memorizing surahs, and she's you know about to be seven years old. Um, so it was revealed to an unlettered prophet, and it contains no contradictions, even though it was revealed over 23 years. It wasn't revealed all at once. It's a book that improves people's lives. It has a unique use of the Arabic language that was not used in that time especially. Um, it contains God's challenge, which is to produce a surah or a chapter just like it. And the shortest surah in the Quran is only three verses long. And nobody then, now, or in the future will be able to replicate it. It's produced the largest practiced religion in the world. It's produced the fastest growing religion in the world. And it deals with diverse subjects like economics, social, social justice, animal wel welfare, and environment that are just as relevant today as they were back then and would improve society as a whole if they were implemented. And uh, I will pass that back over to you to dive more into it. Alhamdulillah. Thanks for, thank you for sharing that, sister. Now I'll just share my screen. Anyone on the panel would like to add on to what Sister Naila just say? Maybe you can just uh, add on while I while I, you know, bring up the screen. Oops. <laughs> All right. Bring up the screen. One moment. Sorry, guys, for the stall. Can you see the, the screen, guys? Yes, now. Is, now is we it can. too small or should I? Is this better? It's better now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, for any book to claim that it is the word of God, it has to stand the test of time, and has to be free from contradictions. Okay. Oops. What happened now? Okay. Yes. So, just a general overview of the Quran. The Quran was first revealed to our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, fourteen hundred years ago in the West Arabian towns, Mecca and Medina, over the span of twenty-three years beginning in 610, ending with his death in 632 CE. Originally, the Quran was not a book, and the first verse of the Quran was revealed in one of the last 10 days of Ramadan in the cave of Hira, a mount that is located near Mecca. Words of the Quran were passed from one generation to the next by way of oral tradition and was later made into a book so that it would be easy for Islam to spread far and wide. Besides being the final book of revelations, the Quran is also a book of signs. And why is that so? So in the Quran, we have ayah. Ayah is a singular form and ayat is the plural form. It's a word that is mostly used to refer to the verse in the Quran. Its literal meaning is a sign that points to something. And any sign that points to the existence of power and greatness of Allah is referred to as an ayah. So it's, yeah, some examples of the the word sign being used in the Quran. They swear, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, they swear by Allah, their most solemn oaths that, that if a sign were to come to them, they would certainly believe in it. Say, O Prophet, signs are only with Allah. What will make you believers realize that even if a sign were to come to them, they would still not believe? This is in Surah Al-Anam, verse 6. Uh, chapter 6 verse 109 and there's one more time it says actually there's many parts in the Quran that says I'm just going to give you three examples whenever a sign comes to them from their Lord they turn away from it this is in Surah Al-Anam verse 6 uh, chapter 6 verse 4 and surely in this is a sign for those who believe Surah Al-Hijr chapter 15 verse 77 
So I'm going to touch on the linguistic miracles of the Quran. Okay. Um, so, so before we begin, you know, there's like astrological, cosmological, uh, physiological, and even geographical mi miracles of the Quran. So tonight we'll just touch on a few and a part of those few only. <laughs> Okay, so at the time when the Quran was revealed to our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Arabs were the masters of literature and eloquence. It was also during the age of literature and poetry. Muslims and non-Muslim scholars have claimed that the Quran to be the best Arabic literature to be available in the world. The Quran challenged them, challenged them. The book actually challenged them by saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, say, if the mankind and the genes, uh, basically genes are the unseen, you can call them like spirits, um, were together to produce the like of this Quran, they could not produce the like thereof, even if they helped one another. And we have truly set forth every kind of lesson for humanity in this Quran. Yet most people persist in this belief. This is in Surah Al-Isra, chapter 17, verse 88 and 89. And again, the Quran challenges them. Or do they say, he has fabricated this Quran. You know, like some people say that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, fabricated it. So say, O Prophet, produce 10 fabricated surahs of chapter like it and seek help from whoever you can, other than Allah, if what they say is true. So nobody could have uh, done it even till today. And if you are in doubt of what we have sent down to our faithful servant, Muhammad, then bring forth one surah chapter like that and call your witnesses other than Allah if you are truthful but if you do not and you will never be able to this is the affirmation uh, then fear the fire whose fuel is men and stones prepared for the disbelievers so this is how the Quran challenges mankind and guess what the shortest surah the chapter in uh, in it's just a few words in the Quran. Does anybody here on the panelists know what is the shortest surah? Surah, <laughs> just... surah Al Kafa. Yeah, that was uh, recited when uh, Omar Radiallahu Anhu was dying. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. This is brother uh, Idris is exact, uh, absolutely right. Yeah, and this is Surah Al Kafa, just three verses, and this is a chapter, and no one has ever produced. A verse that's a chapter that's similar to it, even with the help of genes. Okay, historical records show that when the Arabs heard the Quran for the first time, they thought it was magic because its level of literature was above what they normally hear and speak with. They used to sneak in the night to hear the recitation of the Quran, and that's why they couldn't accept the challenge given to them. Okay, before I proceed on, you know, uh, panelists, if you have any points on the ad or I want to yeah know. yeah yeah uh, yeah I actually you know that's one thing I kind of found sad because I obviously I don't master Arabic and a lot of Muslims don't right so to experience what uh, in this case what Abu Sufyan Abu Jahl and uh, Ahnas experienced when they you know snuck into the night to listen to the recitation of the Prophet peace be upon him that's something that you know I find so you know, so much sadness in that I cannot uh, yet uh, experience the, the same kind of wonder at the beauty of the Quran because I don't master Arabic. So, yeah, uh, I just wanted to add that that's something I, I still struggle with, um, which is why I want to learn Arabic. But okay. Marshall, thanks for sharing that thought. And, uh, you know, um, I think it's, it's true. You know, even myself, I'm Chinese like you, Brother Iskander, different nationality. Um, the Arabic word is something we, we also struggle with at first, but you know, it's something mir miraculous that we can memorize it and say it, recite it during our prayers, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. All right. Um, next, we have this from Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2. Sorry, you don't know. Oh, sorry. I think I wrote it down wrongly. <laughs> it's to be chapter 53, verse 33 to 34, not Surah Al-Baqarah. Okay. Um, or do they say he has made it up, rather they do not believe? Then let them produce a statement like it. If they should be truthful, then let them be, bring a statement like it if they are truthful. So the Quran again say, you know, uh, bring bring something similar to it. Now, this is a non-Muslim 
who who has you know read the Quran, and this is his quote quote from him his words. Okay, it's in, it is impossible that Muhammad peace be upon him authored the Quran. How could a man from being illiterate become the most important author in terms of literary merits in the world of Arabic literature? How could he then pronounce truth of a scientific nature that no other human being could possibly have developed at that time? And all this without once making a single error in his pronouncement on the subject. So this is a French medical doctor who said it in his book, um, The Bible, The Quran and Science. It's 1978, page 125. Can go check it out by Maurice. I hope can, I I, uh, can I add something? Yes. Um, so I, I, I realized this when I was watching Omar, the series uh, recently in Ramadan. Uh, but I found it very interesting. So in the in the Quran, there's a chapter dedicated to Abu Lahab, who was the the fiercest opponent of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in that surah, Allah says, like, nothing will help you on the day of judgment, not your wealth, not your children, nothing. In that, Allah is saying, like, you will never become Muslim because if you become Muslim, everything's forgiven. Like even the lady who ate the Prophet's uncle's liver, <laughs> she was forgiven when she converted to Islam, you know. But he's so vile that Allah says, never will you convert to Islam. And if Abu Lahab wanted to discredit the Quran, all he had to do was convert to Islam. And he would discredit the entire Quran by saying, look, I'm a Muslim now, so you can. But he could never do it. He could never bring himself to say these words, even though it would give him victory, you know, subhanAllah. And I think this is sort of a challenge similar to the produce one ayat, uh, one surah like it, you know, because it seems like an easy challenge to win but it's impossible because Allah has destined it to never never become, you know. So I thought that was a, a bit interesting as well. Thanks for sharing that, sister. Wow, beautiful. MashaAllah. Right, so uh, next, what else we have here? Okay, again, Prophet Muhammad Wasallam was illiterate, one who is unable to read or write, thus coming out with um, an in, in, inimitable literary excellence and eloquence versus within the Quran is a miracle itself and a proof that is impossible to be produced by him, even by the Arabs themselves. Right. Okay. The, the Quran is the only holy scripture in the world that make that many people of any nationality of ethnicity can memorize from cover to cover. And there's only one version in its original language, the classical Arabic recited since the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that basically means even for us today, every word that we recite from the Quran is the same words that our beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam has recited to his people. And therefore, there's only one version. The youngest person who memorized the Quran from cover to cover, also known as the Hafiz, is Abdul Rahman Farah, a three-year-old Algerian. Or the oldest person who memorized the Quran from cover to cover is a grandmother uh, um Sa Saili, I hope I pronounced it right correctly, the age of 82. So I'm going to share with the audience right now a video. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, this little boy is only three years old, Algerian, and he memorized the Quran from cover to cover. Isn't that miraculous? I don't think my anyone I know at the age can do that yet <laughs> with any book, right? Uh, Alhamdulillah. Okay, so back to the sharing. Next. Okay. This is what the Quran says also in Surah al Koma. Chapter 54, verse 32. And we certainly made the Quran easy to remember. So is there anyone who will who will be mindful? So you see the youngest person and even 80-something years old lady could 
memorize the Quran. From Do you know what the beauty of that uh, phrase is, yeah. though? So yeah. remember and being mindful are two very different things, right? We can mm. remember many things, but do we internalize it? Do we implement it into our lives? Do we actually keep, you know, um, there's this whole like movement now of like mindfulness and like being present and all of that. But do we do that like with the teachings of the Quran, whether it comes to like our character, our adab, or, you know, our practice keeping away from sins, minor sins, major sins, you know? So it's beautiful that Allah says it's easy to remember, but are you mindful of it? You know, mm. it's two very different things, subhanAllah. Yeah, great that you pointed out, sister. I think I didn't catch that until you said mindful and remembering something is totally different. Yeah, it's it's more in depth. You need to kind of internalize it and kind of reflect upon it. So that's why he uses the word mindful. Yeah. So you just jump in a little. Just now you yes. were sharing about the age gap and all that, right? And then there's this uh, series from HBO, I, if I'm not wrong. It's called mm -hmm. Quran by Heart. You can find it on YouTube now. And it's mm. such a beautiful like docu-series kind of thing. No, it's not the docu it's like a it's like a one one time movie of sorts. So it shows of three kids, one from Mauritius, one from uh Tan Tajikistan, and the other one from Egypt. They were the like top three of the competition to memorize the Quran. Different countries all come together and it's a really beautiful like series for you to get inspired. So you can check it out on YouTube, inshallah. That one is the children's Quran competition, yeah, right? The Rida yeah, yeah. and all that. Oh, that's so beautiful. That's yeah, really inspiring. <laughs> wow, mashallah. I didn't know this, so I also going should check on YouTube. Actually, Islam mm. Channel holds a competition. Sorry, I'm an ex Islam Channel employee, but they hold a competition every year actually of um of of uh, Quran recitation competition. And it's all children, mashallah. And you know, sometimes they're really young, four or five years old, and up to like thirteen years old and you know, they're all competing against each other. And in any sport and stuff, you never have two people different ages competing against each other. But in the Quran, they can, mashallah, barakallah, compete. Mashallah. And, and I can, can I add a personal story to this? Yes, yeah, so definitely, please do. So I'm just going to share this because I hope that it inspires more people to actually pick up the Quran and learn to read it in Arabic, inshallah. So my daughter is five years old right now. Mm -hmm. uh, when she was three plus, she could already read parts of the Quran and when she was four she was quite fluent with it and it was the easiest book to teach her versus other subjects that we taught her you know even in uh, we taught her like the language everything but after her ability to read the Quran fluently the other subjects fell into place so she's good with her math with her English um, her language whatever so whatever subjects thrown to her now she can really take it and uh memorization is also easy for her because uh she just listens to it uh every day and we ask her to repeat what she's learned and alhamdulillah she's memorized quite a bit of surahs mm -hmm. along the way and it also inspires us because now we have to keep up to make sure that we memorize more than her <laughs> <laughs> i cannot fall back right now you know now's not the time for me to <laughs> fall back <laughs> so i have to keep up the pace with her so mm -hmm. i think that's something that i find the quran Mashallah, it's easier to teach, really. I've I've taught many students how to read the Quran, and within one year, six months, they are able to get to the Quran, inshallah. If they put in the effort, lah. If they don't, then Allah. Alhamdulillah. Thanks for sharing that, brother. That's a, a personal experience, everyone. So as you can see, it's proving that the Quran is easy to pick up, memorize, and uh, even as young as you know, brother Hafiz children. <laughs> No, All right. Uh, I'm going to add that as well. You know, I feel whether I go to a Sunni mosque, a Shia mosque, or any mosque, a lot of them have Quran competitions for the children, for the elderly, for everyone. And, you know, I think everybody can agree on this panel. We never had anything like that in Christianity, did we? No. <laughs> no. No. That's sad. No. Well, well said, brother. Actually, that yeah. kind of reminds me of a story I heard once. I don't know if any of you can confirm this, but it's about a Jewish man who, uh, I think he went to a Muslim ruler and he, he was asking about, um, I don't know what he was asking about, but he basically, he uh, what he did was he wasn't a Muslim yet and he went away and then he took the uh, Torah and then he basically made some changes to it and he brought it to a printing house and then the printers, they just printed it Okay, no problem. He did the same with uh, with with the New Testament, 
and they reprinted it, no problem. And then the third time he tried to do it with the Quran and then he brought it to a Muslim publishing house and they said, dude, this is all wrong. You know, they just opened it and they read it and it's like, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. You changed a lot of things. So they just threw it back in his face. And it, and then the guy went back to the ruler and he said, you know, I'm, I'm converted now. I'm, I'm a Muslim because, you know, I'm now com uh, convinced of the preservation of the Quran uh, due to the fact that the Muslims of the publishing house could recognize it so easily. Just, you know, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's uh, perfectly well mm -hmm. said. He was, a he was a calligraphy artist. So basically he would try to make uh, the Torah as pretty as possible. And he tried to make the Bible as pretty as possible. And being since his calligraphy was so nice, uh, people basically overlooked any of the mistakes that was in it. And when he did that with the Quran, we basically told him to burn it. Oh, oh that's something new. I, I didn't know. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, most people say, you know, we have... They get confused the word version and translation uh, um, because we have many translations of the Quran, but there's only one version. You know what I mean? It's basically um, you translated the, the first version of it. That's all. There's no there's no changes to the verse and anything. So it's just a translation. And you will notice that even though you have like Muhammad, uh, you have Piktal, you have uh, the clear Quran and all that, the English is still around the same they they don't really change much in the in the language as well in the, the english that they use um and uh, the other thing is uh, brother also mentioned about you know um the quran being preserved right so if if you were to burn every single quranic book that you can find today i think inshallah in three days it can all come back <laughs> because there's always somebody who memorizes the Quran from cover to cover, and that's how it's preserved. So they can write out the whole Quran in three days again. But today you have digital stuff, so you can literally, you know, get it online. <laughs> so it's going to be there for, for life. Yeah, inshallah. All right. Um, next, let's continue on scientific miracles. There's a lot, okay? <laughs> on Okay, this one. Okay, wait, before we begin, <laughs> this one. Do all, everyone here believe that our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam split the moon. Yes. Yes. 100%. I believe it 100%. Yes. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Because I mean, sometimes I ask people this question and they will say, no, that's not possible. And some of them are Muslims, um, but actually it's in the Quran itself that says that also. So as Muslims, we have to believe whatever the Quran says, right? Because it's the word of God. So um, it's clear. Over here, you can see. Uh, on one occasion, this is the context, the story. On one occasion, a night of the full moon, not long after it had risen, when it was to be seen hanging in the sky above the Mount Hira, a body of disbelievers from the Quraysh approached our beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and asked him to split the moon in two as a sign that he was indeed the messenger of God. Many others were also present, including believers and those who were hesitant, doubtful, basically. And when the demand was made, all eyes were turned towards the luminary. Great was their amazement to see it divide into two halves, which drew away from each other until there was half a moon shining brightly on either side of the mountain. Be you witness, the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, uh, but the but those who had made the demand rejected this optic miracle as mere magic, saying that he had cast a spell over them. The believers, on the other hand, rejoiced, and some of the hesitants entered Islam, while others came nearer to doing so. Now, so this is where the verse in the Quran that says this: "The hour has drawn near, and the moon was split in two. Yet, whenever they see a sign, they, th they turn away, saying, Same old magic. They rejected the truth and followed their own desires, and every matter will be settled. Even though the stories of destroyed nations that have already come to them are a su sufficient deterrent, this Quran is profound in wisdom, but warnings are of no benefit to them. This is in Surah al kama chapter 54, verse 1 to 5. And... Science has also shown this. So NASA photograph from Apollo 10 in 1969, Rima uh, Ariadius, one of the many 
right, rallies in the release in the surface of the moon has been claimed on internet forums to be evidence of the splitting of the moon. So, yeah. So the Quran leaves it to everyone to decide from that. Because the, again, there's more miracles, uh, scientific miracles, but, you know, I'll go on to the next one, biological miracles. Anyone want to add to scientific miracles? You feel that, you know, there's a need to cover that that in, in, in that topic? Feel free to to jump in. Nope. All good? All right. Okay, so next, biological miracles. So we wonder how does, you know, someone 1400 years ago, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu who is literate, could actually say this, okay? And indeed, we created humankind from an extract of clay, then place each human as a sperm drop in a secure place. Then we develop the drop into a clinging clot of blood, then develop the clot into a lump of flesh, then develop the lump into bones, then clothe the bones with flesh. Then we brought it into being as a new creation. So blessed is Allah, the best of creators. This is, if you notice, it's describing the embryo. Um, you can see it says, you know, the conception part is when then place each human as a sperm, drop in a secure place, and then we develop that drop into a clean clot of blood. You realize that, you know, it becomes like a leash. It sticks on the womb of the, of the woman and then develop the clot into a lump of flesh. Then from it, they develop into bones and clothe the bones with another flesh. You know, Allah is very specific. He started with, you know, cells and then it forms like a flesh and then he created the bones. You can see the fingers come first, then the flesh wrap over the bones and then we brought it into being a human form as a new creation. So blessed is Allah, the best of creators. Now, you see, this This is impossible for someone who don't have a microscope at a time, <laughs> who don't have the technology to see that in, in a woman's womb, yet he could describe the embryo um, being formed in, in the woman's body. Isn't that uh, a miraculous thing? Like, you know, how could someone actually do that? Okay, maybe I share with you a video here, right at this point. <laughs> and is said to be the official, unchanged, pure word of God, revealed over 1400 years ago. Claiming to be the word of God is a heavy statement, and without proof or if a single contradiction is found within the book, the apparent word of God will be proven false. So without further ado, let's put the book to the test. In the 23rd chapter, titled The Believers, from the 12th to the 14th verses, God is said to give a detailed description of how the human being is formed. It begins by saying, We then placed him as a sperm drop in a place of settlement, firmly fixed. Then we made the drop into a alaqa. We will translate this word very soon. And then we changed the alaqa into a lump. Then we made out of that lump into bones. And then we clothed the bones with flesh. Then we caused him to grow and come into being and attain the definitive human form. In the 21st century, we can now safely say that this verse is clearly describing the process of human development in correct chronological order. However, what we should be paying attention to in particular is the second stage, referring to the development of the embryo. The specific word used to describe the embryo in this verse is the word alaqa. The word alaqa when translated into English, can mean three separate things. Firstly, a blood clot or to be suspended, that is to be hanging or clinging to something. Or thirdly and finally, a leech. Now, all three definitions don't come anywhere near what we perceive to be the human embryo. So, why are these words used and what significance do they share with the human embryo? Can the embryo be described as a blood clot? Well, what do you think? In the third week of embryonic development, a tubular heart joins with the blood vessels to form a primordial cardiovascular system. And by the end of the third week, the blood is circulating and the heart begins to beat on day 21. 
The first thing that comes to mind in regards to being suspended or hanging is the umbilical cord. But we can't use that example because we are simply referring to step two, before the baby has even formed. But we now know today that the umbilical cord is formed from the connecting stalk. And the connecting stalk is formed as soon as the embryo is formed. The embryo's connecting stalk has even been described by John Allen and Beverly Kramer as an object to suspend the developing embryo in the extra embryonic column. So an embryo is suspended and does have a strong resemblance with the blood clot. What on earth would an embryo have to do with a leech? Figure A shows the structure of an embryo at 25 days. Figure B shows a leech. Now please note once again that the embryo in this stage is no greater than the size of a kernel of wheat. This is an x-ray of the embryo at 22 days. This is the internal structure of a leech. It's mind-blowing stuff, but you still haven't seen anything yet. This is the head of the embryo at 22 days. The detail you are seeing right now is absolutely impossible to be seen with the human eye and can only be seen with a microscope. This is the back end of a leech. There's no other words used to describe this other than mind-blowing. The pictures we have shown you are impossible to be seen with the human eye or even to be predicted by the human mind. Once again, the verses we have shown you were revealed over 1400 years ago to a man who couldn't read nor write. Are these the words of God? Descriptions of the human embryo in the Quran cannot be based on scientific knowledge in the 7th century. The only reasonable conclusion is that these descriptions were revealed to Muhammad from God, from God, from God, from God, from God, from God. From God. Wow. Yep, that last verse was what God showed me when I asked for a sign. Really? <laughs> That's why I remember that verse. <laughs> yep, all right. Uh, anything to add from what you just watched, brothers and sisters? You feel free. First of all, mashallah, barakallah, the brother who does that spoken word, he's like unbelievable. Mashallah, barakallah, his videos like get so much non Muslim viewership. I love yeah. it. But you know, another thing like to do with the leech, like when I was pregnant. I was like, literally, I feel like I have a leech inside of me because they suck everything from you, your nutrients, your blood, everything they take from you as like the host, as the mother, you know? And that's another sort of characteristic that I always found interesting as Allah describing them as leeches. <laughs> and they don't stop until they move out of your house. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I believe I'll say, yeah, my, my son still does that, clinging on to my wife. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, next, we shall look at some geographical miracles in the Quran. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. God is the one who caused two bodies of water to flow, one palpable and sweet, the other salty and bitter. He placed a barrier between them, a partition that they are forbidden to surmount. He also causes two bodies of water to flow and meet together. But between them is a barrier. So, sorry, this is a sec another... Uh, chapter and verse of the Quran again God specifically said that there's actually fresh water and salt water meeting on earth but they don't mix now if you think about this um, if you take a glass of water then you fill it with salt and another glass of water just plain water you know you just put it in a tank they would just mix and it would be diluted salty water but God says that he created two ocean bodies or two uh, bodies of uh, water that meet, one salty, one fresh, and they don't mix because there's a barrier between them. Is there really such a, a, a occurrence on Earth? Is there really such a thing on Earth? Well, go Google it. I'm going to Google it right now. <laughs> Hang on. Um, let me find the share button. Sorry, guys, is you know, eat so I kind of had to visit and everything. <laughs> no time, 
Oh, every why time, is this image not supporting you? Every time I hear that word in Arabic, that's the first thing I think of is that barrier in the ocean. Boehner. Yeah. Ah, yeah, there you go. Wait, hang on. Can you see it now? Share screen. Chrome. Okay, there we go. Well, Share. Can? Yeah. Yeah. So this this actually exists on a where you have two bodies of water meeting, one fresh, one salt. I mean they have fishes and you know ecology that is for salt water and also fresh water. But in between them uh, is a barrier and they will never mix. Such a miraculous thing, right? I mean, think about it at that time, will the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Actually, you know, is it possible for him to notice that like, he's he's living in Arabia in the desert and there's like sand everywhere? I mean, even if he has a boat, he wouldn't be able to travel so far out into the ocean to find this, to know about this, or have a satellite to see this. But he could tell you this from the Quran, right? So, mashallah, this is uh, go and Google it if you want to find out more about these two ocean bodies that meet and don't and don't mix, All right? But he's uh, Richard Dawkins try to debunk this. Oh, yeah. Got, there are people who try to debunk this? Yes, yeah, so Richard Dawkins, uh, one of the uh, famous atheist uh, kind of leaders, you could say. He's, uh, he's got his, he was a professor for biology. He's a really good biology professor, but um, he also focuses on religion. He's not so great there. And so basically, you see him going to like an African tribe. And inside of a glass, he puts fresh and salt water in it and mixes it. And it's just kind of embarrassing to him because he's putting it on such a small scale to where like you could like what you just did. You Googled it. He could have just done that. So there's actually a video of himself embarrassing himself. That's actually gotten a lot of traction because everybody who's seen this video has been easily able to debunk it. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think you, you can try to debunk God's words, <laughs> but alhamdulillah. I didn't know. Didn't work out too well for him. Yeah. He's a smart okay, guy. So he never brings that up anymore at all. Mm. Mm. So next is numerical miracles. Um, I'll try my best to express it. Okay. So um, I found out that, you know, the word yam, singular without suffixes, it's called day in the Quran, and it's mentioned 265 times. So it's exactly the number of days we have in, in our calendar. Um, Allah mentions both lunar and solar calendar in the Quran. And if we follow the seasons of the year, then we are actually following the solar calendar. Um, shar, singular without suffix, suffixes, um, month, is also mentioned 12 times in the Quran. You know, um, Rajul, singular without suffixes, men. Guess the number of times men is mentioned in the Quran 24 times, and women, Amara, is also mentioned 24 times. So it's it's like equal. Uh, Malaika, angels, I mentioned 88 times, um, and the devil, also 88 times. Um, Singular form, angel 68, and devil also the same, 68 times. I mean, how can you get down even to the, you know, numerical accuracy of, of, of you know, describing words in the Quran? I mean, to you take any book today and, and you, you count the number of times it says men and the number of times it says women and it's supposed to be equal, you know. <laughs> How can you write a book like that uh, as a human being? I, I don't think you can do that and make sense out of this whole book while doing that. Yeah, so... And it was, it was never written down at that time, right? So you would have to do it literally from memory of these 600 plus pages worth of Arabic writing. Mm -hmm. um, I shared in our private chat, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, for Daus, uh, but Numan Ali Khan actually does a beautiful infographic of what you've just explained, but on an even larger scale of more linguistical miracles um, and nu numerical miracles within uh, the Quran. And it is quite beautifully done. Great. I'll share it. I, I, I just saw it. Okay. Now let me put it up. Share. 
Uh, here, I think. Yeah. Let me know if you can hear it. Okay. He does not know how to read or write. So how is he giving the Quran to people? He's speaking it. He's speaking it. So the people who believed in him, those 23 years that were, they were with him, they did not see a book. If they thought of the Quran, you know what they thought of? Like the Prophet's face came in their head and his voice rang in their head. You understand? Like for them, they could not think of the Quran without thinking of the Prophet. We can do that. When we think of the Quran, sometimes we don't think of the Prophet. We just think of a book. For them, the Prophet and the, the message and the messenger were inseparable. The Quran comes down over 23 years. It's not been put in book form. It's not been put into a database. It hasn't been put into a search engine. Now it has. Now what the Prophet said has been put into a search engine. It's been put into a database. So you can actually do a search. How many times does the Quran say this word? You can do that. Could you do that back then? So now, after 23 years of this book, and centuries and centuries later, we have this book in book form. This book uses the word ad-dunya. You know what the dunya means? This world. This book uses the word this world 115 times. 115 times. What word is used? Ad-dunya. Did anybody know that back then? They had no idea. This book also uses al-akhirah. This life, ad-dunya, al-akhirah, the next life. It uses it 115 times. This book uses the word angels 88 times. Malaika, 88 times. It uses the word devils, Shayateen, 88 times. The word life occurs 145 times in the entire Quran. Al-Hayat, life. Do you want to take a guess what else comes in the Quran 145 times? Death. Death. The word death occurs in the Quran 145 times. The word good deeds. Good deeds are mentioned 167 times. A salihah and a sayyah, bad deeds. 167 times. The word disbelief is mentioned 17 times. Belief is mentioned 17 times. Iblis is mentioned by name 11 times. Seeking refuge from Iblis is mentioned 11 times. They said, the phrase they said occurs 332 times. And the Quran says, say, 332 times. Uh -huh. How is it possible that in, in like 23 years of revelation, he uses the word month only 12 times? Yeah. Days actually only use 365 times. There's just a few. Just word counts. Is that humanly possible? We just think about nope. that. Is that humanly possible? Somebody speaks for 23 years, doesn't write any of it down, and these words seem to line up perfectly. MashaAllah. You know, wow. I was just thinking while he was talking, I was like, if I wrote an essay, you know, just a couple of pages, and tried to do that, and write it in a beautiful and poetic way and get everything matching and making sense and having purpose and guidance and inspiration and all the things that the Quran gives us and like rules and regulations and I wouldn't be able to do it like of course not like it's mind-blowing and that's on a small scale subhanallah but the Quran is like this massive book and uh, yeah so I, I thought that those might expand a little bit more on how magnificent these these coincidences some people might call them are yeah and you know Sister Nyla was formerly an atheist. <laughs> I mean, this book kind of moved her. Moved her. I was one of those annoying atheists, <laughs> you know, kind of like the guy you were talking about just now would go around and be like, no, this isn't true, and like be annoying about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, mashallah. Uh, anything that, Brother Hafiz, your name is the Hafiz, so. <laughs> so much pressure on my name. But. <laughs> <laughs> Do for me, inshallah. <laughs> but I just want to say that uh, I mean, this is amazing. Like, I mean, going down, we know that Allah talks about uh, the goodness of our life, like heaven twice than the suffering of Jahannam. You know, all this is in the Quran, and that's a miracle that we should follow. Uh, and one one thing that that strikes that stands out for me is 
how it was delivered like why at that precise moment when the when the prophet shared there were still people who believed him like you and you get where i'm coming from like imagine now i come to you and i say hey guys and lady uh let's do this there's a new religion uh, i get re- i got revelation from god and i try to explain things to you and it seems very perfect in everything that i say and how it, in that era it happened is because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was already al amin and that is one of the biggest uh like takeaway i have from this is because the prophet himself was an honest man and you know some people say oh you don't you know the, don't tell the truth so much you know you need to lie a bit to survive and all that no i truly believe if you tell the truth you then you don't don't have to lie you don't have to think of your lie just tell the truth whether it's good or bad and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was that because he took care of the people's sheep he was so he was already known to be the most honest trustworthy person of the era and that's why when the quran came down there were a certain group of people who wholeheartedly didn't hesitate to believe the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that is how islam grew from there right the, the people that followed him at that point of time abu bakr uh, the wife khadija and all that so so that's why the quran it's yes the quran is miracle but the person who brought the quran to the mass that quality is something that we muslims should have in us no matter how bad or how push back we are to the walls and all that that honesty mashallah yeah. thanks for sharing that take away brother um what about uh, the rest of the panelists what other takeaways you have do share them before we end tonight's stream which is in 3 minutes actually <laughs> Yeah. Fast though. <laughs> yeah. Uh but it's kind of do you, do you want to share your thoughts um about what we shared tonight? Any questions or things you have? Yeah, like Sister Nyla, I was also like a pretty, you know, uh, atheist guy. Uh, I used to listen to Richard Dawkins of, of all people. But uh yeah, no, no, it's part of course this miracle of the Quran that really, you know, it moves your heart but it also it it kind of makes you you look at it and you can't think of a reason other than you know this must be from allah this must be you know this must be from god other than that there's no other explanation and i think that's what's really important about these miracle part of what's really important about the miracle of the quran right or the miracle of revelation yeah mash thanks for sharing that too brother um brother idris <laughs> Well, um I can't so kind of end it uh I think I mentioned it before with the superpower of the Arabian Peninsula before Sallallahu so Alaihi Wasallam there was none. There was nothing before that. It's kind of crazy that people don't see this as why he has revelation when they were just a bunch of Bedouins and camel herders, some of the poorest people on earth took over the entire world. they took over all of it to quote um some Jewish historian um Bedouins and camel herders sitting on the thrones of the Caesars surely this is from Allah mashallah thanks for sharing that beautiful um and yeah i mean um uh, before we go on one more point uh to add also for sister Nyla Uh, would you want to you know end with your uh, take away and then I'll, i'll summarize my part before we go to share yeah i think it's uh, something that we should always you know reflect on the the majesty and the might of the quran the power and the influence that it has and you know always reflecting of where it came back from and what it can do for our lives like that beautiful ayat that you shared you know being mindful and not just reading and if you don't understand the arabic not just reading the arabic all the time but reading the translation and going further into the tafsir as well to understand what was the context what was happening during that time um you know strangely enough watching the omar series in ramadan really made the quran kind of like become alive for me as i was reading it because you understand the context of what was happening in that time and what they were going through and why those words were so important to them at that time and then you can kind of implement that into like different times in your life where you're going through similar um struggles you know subhanallah so uh, that's my takeaway from today zakallah khair for having me thank you so much sister and to all the panelists here for sharing 
apologies again um, if we started late and uh, also I might not feel very eloquent tonight because I don't know why. Maybe I didn't have enough water. <laughs> I don't know. But today was an extremely hot and warm weather out there. I was out in the heat, um, got home to rush this. Um, and, you know, eat celebration was fun, the family and all. So hope you guys understand. Um, also, I try to pull in as many miracles as I can, the top few that I can think of into these slides. Um, there's, of course, a lot more that I come across, but... Uh, you know, it's up to you as a viewer to go and do your research and find out your own. Maybe it will inspire you better that way than us, you know, just talking about it here on the stream. Um, and yeah, I would just want to add that, like, you know, 1400 years ago, an illiterate man who, who you know, revealed this verses of the Quran. Can you imagine if I tell you today um, some words, you know, you first will, will see if I'm a credible source or someone who, you know, give you any proofs that you can believe in. And then next, you know, see where I'm from. Is he Chinese? Is English? Is he good and stuff? You will not believe everything I say, right? But, you know, Prophet Muhammad Wasallam was just saying the truth and he was repeating the truth over and over again to people in the Quran. And and that was the start of Islam. Can, can you imagine, you know, how is that even possible for a man who is illiterate, a man who is a Bedouin in, 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 in the desert? Yeah. So that itself speaks volume of his character, of his... Uh, they call him the walking Quran. His his life itself is the walking Quran. He not only recites it, but he lives the Quran in his life too. So do check out the story of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm going to read about his life story. Don't just take everything from the internet. Uh, find the books, right? There are many books out there that are written also by non-Muslims. They are very good about him. So do do catch, read those books too. Um, and I hope tonight we have inspired everyone to go check to go read the Quran. If you want to find the English translation of it, it's also online. Um, and hopefully you come to embrace Islam, inshallah. Yeah. Um, so going back to Nihilus, uh charity, guys. So you see how much benefit you you get from um, just sharing the Quran and, you know, for someone to memorize the Quran, you're now sponsoring somebody in uh, in Africa, these young orphans, to memorize the Quran. So do be charitable and donate. Um, the link is on the on the comment section. I'll add it also into the description of the, the video tonight. And I'll share it on my Facebook should you want to donate. Feel free to, to donate. And it, this charity will go on for at least two months, right, sister? Yeah, I can extend it. I mean, it's a, it's a three-year program for each of the children. Okay. They've just started three months ago. So, um, yeah, you know, do what you can, inshallah, and, and support a child who yeah. doesn't have anything, you know, to gain the most valuable gift in this world that we can get. Mashallah. And... You know, these, um, these orphans, right, they, they are learning this Quran by heart and, you know, their children and children after them will also learn from them. So you are reaping the rewards also from the generations to come. So Alhamdulillah, you're going to get lots of rewards from, from doing this. So share this, this charity with your friends as well. Yeah. All right. So thank you so much for tuning in tonight, everyone. And inshallah, we'll see you again in the next episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.